Hello and welcome to Renewable English. Today we have our interview with, you guessed it, a cycling expert. We're talking all about transport and for me, my favourite form of transport is cycling. So our resident cyclist is Hattie Blackmore. She also happens to be my childhood neighbour. Hi there Hattie. Hi Harry, long time no see. Indeed, um, I have a bit more of a beard now. You do, and you're an adult. I am an adult, and so are you, which is nice wow. to see. <laughs> the joys of growing up. Um, <laughs> so is it okay if I ask you a few questions about cycling and Absolutely, and yeah. Wonderful. I'm going to jump straight in then. Uh, what I want to know, what we want to know at Renewable English, with, with all of our guests really, starts with inspiration. So I want to know... When and why did you get into cycling? Good question. Um, I guess I got into cycling properly when I was about 18. I'd always been able to cycle, but I'd moved to a new city. Uh, I was exploring Bristol for the first time as a student. And classically, as a student, I was skint. Um, Cycling a bike around rather than driving a car saves you tons of money, so that was nice. It was a good way to explore a new city. And I spent ages in libraries, writing essays, um, producing papers. So as soon as five o'clock hit, um, I'd kind of want to get outside and remember that it was an outside world to explore. So jumping on my bike uh, and cycling back home rather than getting into a car and getting stuck in a traffic jam was really freeing and liberating. Brilliant. I love the freedom of being on a bike. There's, there's nothing better. You know, I'd say wind in my hair, but you know, obviously I wear a helmet. Wind in your beard. Wind, wind in, your in beard. my beard. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Someone once told me actually, there's a good expression. Um, it's like translated from a different language, um, but it's like the expression translates as freedom has two wheels. And I thought that was quite good. Oh, I like that. Um, I might start stealing that. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, now, we talked a bit about the freedom with cycling, but mm -hmm. what are the benefits of cycling? How long have you got? Um, OK, let's think, where do I start? I suppose let's talk about it on both an individual level. So what good cycling do, can do for you and your friends and family. And then we can think big and we can think, OK, what can it do for society? And if we go really big, what can it do for the planet? Um, so in terms of what can cycling do for you as an individual, there's there's loads of good things that comes out of it. It's cheap. So it's much cheaper than running a car or getting public transport. You can jump on a bike, get from A to B, and it will always be free. It's also cheaper than a gym membership. So cycling is a really, really good form of cardio exercise. It gets your heart pumping, your blood going around your body. And on top of that, on top of the physical benefits, like it's gonna be great for your mind. It, it's, it ticks all of those boxes in terms of um, having a positive impact on your mental well-being as well. When you get on a bike, we talked about it being very freeing experience, um, but it's it's a great way of getting out into nature and discovering green spaces, even just outside the city. Um, it gets serotonin going. It's it's going to make you feel good. It's a feel good thing that you can do that doesn't cost you any money. I suppose in terms of your individual well being as well, it's going to it's going to be really good, just not just for your body, but just in terms of, you know, increasing activity levels is going to reduce your risk of heart disease later in life. Um, so you're going to live longer, basically, and a better quality of life. All good All things there, that's All good for sure. things, yeah. Why would you not do it, some might say. I have no <laughs> idea. I love riding my bike. <laughs> Oh, and it's fun, obviously. That is a big game changer. Um, OK, so let's go bigger than that. Um, what can it do for society and then the planet as a whole? It's a really easy way of having a positive impact upon the environment. So 
it's kind of in line with small changes that you can make to your lifestyle um, that are very doable and don't cost you any money or involve massive, massive grand level of change. It's like recycling. It's like um, going vegetarian, right? Swapping some of your everyday journeys, especially those short ones where you're just popping to the supermarket. If you get on your bicycle and don't make those short journeys by car, it's going to have a great impact on reducing your emissions. So reducing those really kind of harmful diesel fuel, diesel emissions and diesel fuel in the cities. And it's also going to um, tackle another really big problem, which is air pollution. So you've got the two things there. You've got that we want to reduce diesel fuel and we've got to have a positive impact on the climate. And we've got that actually our cities that we live in, the air that we're breathing in is really bad for our health especially the most vulnerable. So we're thinking of children, we're thinking of the older people in our society, the people that are already living with health conditions. So just by cycling, when you go and get your daily shop or your weekly shop or whatever, you're already doing right by your community and actually every everyone on the planet. So, wow. I mean, um, that's what I've done here, especially with the short journeys, we either, we either walk, um, when we go to school, we usually walk, although there are yeah, days yeah. We, we grab the bike because it's about it's only about 20 minutes away. But we, we'd never take the car now unless it's absolutely chucking it down with rain. Yeah, Nobody yeah. wants to be sitting at school in soaking <laughs> wet clothes. We know that. Um, but yeah, we always bike or walk to school. You know, it's so much quicker as well. Like... Um, they started in England, in a lot of the cities, they started putting signposts um, from the centre of town to things like the universities and the hospital. And instead of stating, you know, how far it was, they also put how long it would take you to cycle in minutes, because often it was much, much quicker than, oh, let's get in our let's get in our car and be stuck in a like traffic jam for half an hour or, oh, mm, I think I'll do like a five, 10 minute cycle. That's a really good idea. I like yeah, that. behavior change. I'm going to introduce that to, to Spanish society. Let's see. What, you're I, going uh, to do some guerrilla sign painting? Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can say that I'll do that. <laughs> um, but it is a good okay. idea. Maybe Let's go back into safer territory. <laughs> yeah. Somebody um, around him might do it, but it definitely won't be me. <laughs> Um, and I suppose the last thing that I'd say is also it it kind of it reduces the strain on local health services. If you if you build little bits of activity in your into your day to day life and into the life of your children and, and your family, then you're less likely to come down with chronic illnesses later in life that are going to put a strain on your doctor's surgery and your healthcare system. So it's kind of that thinking ahead. It's that long-term thinking. It's a preventative measure. That's, that's actually something I've not really thought about, to be honest. You know, I thought about the health benefits and I thought mm -hmm. about the environmental benefits, but I'd not thought the kind of long-term of, yes, I'll be healthier, but so in future, I won't have those issues, which is kind of short-sighted of me, I guess, but that's a really good point. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, <laughs> shall we move on to the next question? Yeah, sure. So, um, how can people get into biking? Um, and how can we encourage those people who say, oh, but it's dangerous? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's deal with them as like two different questions. So, when people say to me, how can I get into cycling? I'm like, this is one of my favorite questions. Um, so the good news is it's really easy and really doable. So we can think about it in terms of the practical things that you need to do to get into cycling. And then we can think about it in terms of like the resources that are around you and the people that are around you that you can reach out to you to support you on that journey. Um, so like practically, yeah, OK, you're going to need a bike. That's like the 101 of cycling. But you know, if you are on a budget or even if you haven't got much money, what you could do was you could reach out to a friend 
um you could borrow a bike you could in a lot of cities they have bike hire schemes that are very affordable um, yeah. universities often have bike hire and then the other thing is is uh, there are usually within cities organizations and charities so non-profit organizations that are set up to encourage people to cycle more for some of those reasons that we talked about in that it's better for the environment and it's better reducing air pollution there are organizations set up to help tackle that so reach out to those organizations as is with most problems nowadays tap it into google tap in i want to get into cycling and then the name of the town where you live and see what comes up and you'll be pleasantly surprised i think what about those people who say isn't it dangerous now personally i jump on my bike oh you know i am a very careful cyclist uh, i've taught my daughter who's seven and we cycle everywhere together mm -hmm. um to cycle sensibly um we always wear a helmet and so on and so forth but for those people who say but isn't it dangerous what's mm -hmm. What can we say to those guys? Well, I suppose you've touched on some good points there. I mean, there's certain things that you can do to mitigate the risk. So you can wear the right equipment. You know, it's it's pretty basic. If it's dark outside, make sure that you've got a good light. Again, there's charities that can support you with these things. If you're on a low budget, they can provide cheap or free equipment. Um, you can choose to wear a helmet. Um, you can also get free training. Harry will probably know more about this locally, um, but in England there are decision makers and council, um, council advocates that will run free training courses for both children and adults who want to get into cycling. And just cycle confidently, like own that space. I know that when I cycle, when I first started cycling, it was very tempting to make myself very small when I cycled on the road and sort of hug the curb so that I would be out of the traffic. But actually, your safest position is in the middle of the road with a dominant cycling position so that everybody can see you and they won't try and overtake you. So it's little tips like that that can really make you more confident on the road and more visible to drivers. So there's things like cycle safety training, sure. There's things like wearing the right equipment. But actually, there's also other things. Like, I built up my confidence. I, I cycle everywhere now. I've cycled all around Europe. But when I first started properly cycling at about 18, I would only go on green traffic race cycle routes. And actually, I would say, you've got to make your first experience of cycling enjoyable. So if you don't feel comfortable going out on the road, find a local greenway. In Spain, there's a lot of disused railway tracks, just like in England. They've been converted into cycle routes. And the good news about those is they're flat, they're very accessible. Um, there's not going to be any traffic on them. So build up your confidence. Go with a friend um you can wear high vis obviously and actually in terms of casualties uh in terms of people that are in serious accidents actually you're much more likely to have a serious accident in a car than you are when you're cycling so i think it's about challenging misconceptions building up your confidence and not trying to do it alone you need a cheerleader you need a bit of encouragement yeah I, i'm we're really lucky here in in seville because we do have cycle lanes all over the city um, Perfect. or like you can get anywhere in the city with a cycle lane except the massive hill that goes down from my village um oh. which i love personally because you know i can get up to just over 50 kilometers an hour on my bike and i love that maybe not the best idea to do if you're not particularly confident or when there's loads of traffic around something i 
have only ever done when it's been a, an empty road um, <laughs> on a Harry Sunday morning. This is Harry officially not advocating No, I'm not downhill advocating cycling. doing that. Absolutely <laughs> not. It's something I have only done once when I was, you know, going out on a crazy bike ride. Um, and I decided to do that on that hill. But that's about the only place that doesn't have a cycle lane. Yeah, so yeah. for that, there are other routes. There is a green route that you can take you can down through the hills. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I tend to go through the hills. But that one morning, I just thought, I'm going to see how fast I can go. Because I am a very confident cyclist. I have been cycling for a long time. Because um, it's fun. Yeah, because it's and really fun. And cycling's got to be fun, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, if I ever go down there now, I tend to cycle sensibly because there are cars uh -huh. on the road mm -hmm. and it is a good idea to cycle sensibly, I must say. Um, so yeah. The only the only other thing I'd say on the is it dangerous um, topic is every bicycle that we have on the road, so everybody that chooses to take up cycling indicates that there's a demand for cycling within a city. So that increases pressure on local decision makers and city planners to actually implement proper infrastructure. So you can be part of the change basically, and you can do it in a really easy way by getting on a bicycle. You can both with your feet or with your wheels, as it were. Yeah, both of those things. Yeah. Well, you need both of them to cycle, so. Cycling is democratic. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That could be a new hashtag. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on to the next question now. Mm -hmm. um, now, I know that you used to work um, within cycling, um, mm -hmm. within cycling, related to cycling. <laughs> so if you could tell us a bit about that, and then after that, we'll talk about what you're doing now, which I know isn't directly related to cycling, but it is another very important issue. Sure, sure, why not? Um, so I used to work for a charity called SUSTRANS, and that just stands for Sustainable Transport. SUSTRANS were first kind of around in the late 70s, 80s, and it was because there was a stretch of disused railway track in between the city that I live in, Bristol, and a neighbouring city um, in Bath. And what you had in Bristol was a problem that we're all familiar with. There was a lot of congestion, particularly at rush hour and during the school run, and it was adding to um, pollution, it wasn't very pleasant to be in, you name it, it created problems. So a group of hippies, basically, um, as is the case with a lot of social, positive social and environmental change, got together and they were like, right, what can we do with this available space to open it up to pave the way for a different sort of transport and a different way of like being and transporting ourselves around the city? So they they were kind of renegades. They they didn't get permission they from the council. They just got loads of volunteers to tip a load of gravel and stone dust onto the disused railway track. And then they went round in some questionable tie-dye clothing, caftans, and with a megaphone and basically said to the people of Bristol, step out of your cars. There is a completely flat. 17 mile traffic free way of getting home between the two cities and the council was very cross but a really interesting thing started to happen so people started to use the route and then gradually congestion eased people were happier they began feeling a little bit more fit and all of these problems not all of the problems, but a lot of the problems started to ease. So although the council had been very cross at the beginning, they suddenly thought, hang on a minute, we, we might get behind this. So they started to set aside a little bit of funding. And from this pressure group, from this small group of hippies that had originally done this, SUSTRANS was formed, which became a nationwide charity advocating walking and cycling in the interest of environment, positive environmental change. So I used to work for them and I actually used to help um, encourage people to get into cycling and overcome some of those 
perceived or real barriers to cycling like you've named you know people thinking well is this dangerous will it cost me money how do i do this how do i get a bike things like that mm -hmm. so it was helping people basically access the resources that they need to, to to start cycling and make a lifetime habit of it so that's what you used to do um what do you do now well it's something completely different it's still within the charity sector and I do still cycle to work, but I work for the NHS and I support asylum seekers and refugees that are new to Bristol navigate the healthcare system. So obviously when you arrive in a new place uh, and you don't know the language and you have a completely different healthcare system and you have very, very little money and you have been through what is essentially a hostile environment, you need somebody there to support you a little bit and empower you to start navigating the city and the healthcare systems that you're entitled to. So, so that's, that's what you yeah, do. well, me and a team of doctors. So I am the only non-medical one. Um, and I suppose I'm there to befriend people, to support the doctors, to get people's paperwork done, but also to listen to people, to listen to their concerns or answer questions. Um, and of course, cycling inevitably comes up. There's a great project in Bristol that supports asylum seekers and refugees access bicycles, um, partly as a way to explore Bristol and um, to lay claim to some of the space in the city, but also as a way to travel around the city when you're on a really, really tight budget. That's, that's excellent. That's, that's, a really, like, that's a really worthy job. That's a fantastic job. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before we started recording, I've, uh, I've recently taken some, some classes with um, asylum seekers and refugees and mm -hmm. um, <laughs> It's a it's a brand new challenge for me. It's, it's one that you know I understand that people moving to a new country um, don't have the language, don't have the means to to access, like you say, healthcare and so on and so mm -hmm, forth. Mm -hmm. So so for me, being able to to help and give that language um, yeah. to people who who desperately need it has been something that I've found personally very rewarding, and I hope that it is helpful um to those people um although mm -hmm. i you know maybe they end up sounding like somebody from northampton but you know there, <laughs> there, are, there are worse things i think maybe um to, than sounding like you're from northampton, northampton twang <laughs> yeah um most of it's been beaten out of me since i left but oh. you know there are still bits that remain um, so thank you very much. I'm going to draw this to a close now, if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. It's been lovely seeing you again after about 20 something years. Um, if I'm ever cycle touring in Spain, I'll drop by. Exactly. Um, you're more than welcome. You can come and test out our hill um, <laughs> safely. Responsibly, yeah. Exactly, responsibly. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's been a pleasure having you on. It's been lovely to see you and speak to you. And I'll see you soon. Bye.